Hi, I'm Marlo from Wild Food UK, uh, and this is part two of our Back to Basics series that I'm going to be doing during the lockdown period. It's uh, the 16th of April today, and I'm in my garden because I did say in the very first video that most of the plants that, that I was showing you in that video were likely, or some of them anyway, were likely to be in your garden if you have a garden. So I thought I'd prove that point. Now, uh, first of all, though, one little correction from the first video. I did say that the stitchwort was in the cardamine family. I was running through a lot and trying to get a lot in in one take. I have a, an apology to make about that. It's not in the cardamine family. It's in the Stellaria family, along with your chickweeds. Now, down here, like, uh, like with the first video, I'm going to start on some real basics and there is nothing more basic apart from the dandelions in the first video than the nettles I'm showing you here. Now, these are stinging nettles, Urtica doica, and I am getting a little bit stung, but you know, the tips of your fingers are quite tough bits of skin, or at least mine are. You don't want to get stung on your wrist or somewhere like that. Now, nettles from an edibility point of view are obviously a little bit of a risk you really don't want to get stung while you're eating them but these top leaves if you want to eat them raw all you need to do is roll them up in your fingers like I say tough skin there I'm not getting stung pop them in and they taste a little bit like cabbage now you're not going to do that for a meal. For a meal, you would uh, apply heat to the leaves to get rid of the stings. About 70 degrees plus will destroy the stings on a stinging nettle. Um, so boiling them for soup or cooking them or dragging them over a barbecue even, you'll get rid of the stings uh, for cooking. The, the reason to eat a few raw though is because these have an incredibly high vitamin content. There's vitamin A, not as much as the dandelions. There's vitamin B though, there's vitamin C. Uh, there's no vitamin D, but like I said in one of my other videos, you get that from the sunshine while you're picking your nettles. There's vitamin K, there's more iron than spinach. Uh, there's even in the stings, there's uh, neurotransmitters or uh, things like choline and acetylcholine which are, are good for your memory so um, another thing as well for you vegetarians and vegans these leaves when dried I've read that they're about 25% protein which is quite unheard of for a leaf so uh, all round a really really healthy plant if you eat them raw because when you cook them things like vitamin C they change and they're not quite as nutritious these leaves when they're raw now after they've flowered I can't see any in flower here but after they've flowered you want to stop eating them because they become a bit of a diuretic a bit of a laxative and they can develop these little gritty particles that uh, I think can get into your liver um, and they're not good for you so you always want young nettles um, but they're the ultimate cut and come again plant so if you cut some back You'll get young growth and you can eat those young shoots again. Nettles, a real superfood in my opinion, but you do have to get past those things. Now, growing in amongst them, you've got something that looks very much like a nettle. I've done a video on this one before by itself, but it's got these flowers, which you can see like a crown all around the stem. Um, this is a, a plant masquerading as a nettle. This is one of what we call the dead nettles, and this one's white dead nettle, or the bee nettle. Bumblebees love these flowers. Now, all of the dead nettles are edible. These flowers, on a sunny day, actually get quite sweet. Nettles, or sorry, dead nettles, they're in the mint family, or the wider mint family, and a little tip for you, I think you can see it here. All of the mint family have square stems. So there's lots in the mint family. You'll see lots of plants uh, around your garden. I might be able to find one or two more as I'm walking around that are in the mint family. And all of those are edible. They don't all taste very good though. So have a little nibble before you try each one of them. Look out for the square stem and you know you've got a mint. This one, Lamium album, the white dead nettle, is very common and grows bigger than most. So. Uh, a nice little find. I would only really, from an edibility point of view, use the flowers. I'd use them like I would the vetch flowers in the first video I did, just to 
garnish a salad and make it a little bit sweeter in this uh, with these flowers um, and obviously a little bit prettier so nettles and dead nettles got some hawthorn here that was from the first video and like I said you are likely to find it in your garden if you're lucky enough to have a garden now up there we've got our cherry tree absolutely covered in blossom all cherries are edible some of them just don't taste very nice so your bird cherries for example you don't want to use them in your fruit bowl or with your ice cream but you can make jams and things like that out of them if you add sugar or honey or some other sweetener um, the only part that's poisonous of any of the cherries is the stone in the middle so you're not going to eat that anyway don't worry about any cherry you find have a nibble some of the small ones are actually quite sweet we've got loads of different varieties in Britain growing in the wild now they've all escaped and gone feral from people's gardens um, have a nibble if they're nice and ripe they might well be a sweet cherry even if they're only half the size of the ones that you buy in the shops but anyway I've never had any cherries off of that tree because they're all too high and the birds get there first Smaller cherry trees are easier to manage because you can put a net over the top. Right, now we're going to head this way and uh, walk past a little row of lavender. This is a, a row of lavender that we haven't maintained as well as another row that we've got in the garden. So you can see other plants growing up amongst it and it wasn't cut back properly last year. Uh, lavender isn't something that I really use in my cooking. Some people do, and I do know someone who makes a nice lavender jam, but what lavender uh, is really good for is uh, things like soaps. So my wife makes soap out of the lavender that we've got in the garden each year. And uh, also you can use the lavender just to make things like your airing cupboards smell nice. My favorite thing about the lavender that grows in this garden though isn't anything like that. It's that when this stuff comes into flower, it's alive with bees and butterflies. So just along this stretch here, you could maybe see a 500 to 1,000 bees and other insects buzzing around. I'll hopefully show you that later in the year. Lavender is fantastic for the insects. Growing either side of the lavender here, we've got a couple of roses, and uh, they're definitely something that we forage for. Rose hips are quite nutritious they're full of vitamin c i think uh rose hips are just about the highest vitamin c content fruit that we have um, and also you can make itching powder out of the stuff that's in the middle of them now i used rose hips the other day in a in a mixed um fruit leather that i made uh, but rose hips there's plenty of recipes online for and we've got a few in our guide as well so if you look up the recipes section in our guide you'll uh, see some things that you can do with rose hips. All rose hips are edible and all rose petals are edible as well. Now, rose petals are great for infusions into things like vodka. Um, I do like to infuse lots of different bits of alcohol and it's, uh, it's really good to find a really floral, a really, really smelly rose because, uh, and, and a nice colorful one as well because they will turn your vodka a little bit of the color of the petal and the the alcohol that you get in the end does smell like the rose that you put in there so try and find a really nice stinky rose with really bright petals and you can make some lovely drinks just chuck in the rose petals and uh, I always add um, probably half a cup of sugar just to sweeten things up but use that to your own taste and steep that for a couple of weeks and you've got rose vodka. It's really, really worth trying. And um, we're gonna come through here now, which might be a little bit tricky for Will, so we'll go slowly up to uh, my new composter. One of those jobs I've been meaning to do for uh, about a year, but lockdown's given me the time to, to do that. Down here, we've got a plant that I mentioned in the last video in back to basics one this is burdock now burdock is uh, a biannual or a biennial it's got kind of a two-year life cycle 
and you need to know where the plant is in that two-year life cycle before you start harvesting it because it's not the growth above ground that we want from this plant as a forager what we want from this plant is its root its root is lovely and sweet i like to compare it to a, a cross between a sweet potato and a parsnip but the, the texture is firmer so it's great for stews and soups and things like that it's also the sweet side of dandelion and burdock the drink that quite a lot of you will have heard of now i say it's got uh, a two a sort of two season or two year life cycle and you need to know when to pick it um, in its first year it just grows these big basal leaves and it will grow into a giant rosette. Well, there's two types in Britain, actually, Arctium Minus and Arctium Lapa. Um, I think Minus would be the smallest one uh, and that one I don't really go for because obviously if it's a smaller plant, you get a smaller root. Arctium Lapa, I think, is the bigger one of the two and it can get leaves maybe five times as big as this. And the root from that plant can be nearly three feet long sometimes but it'll only be at that point from autumn of its first year through to the sort of late spring of its second year because it grows these big basal leaves which soak up loads of sun and energy to create that giant root and then it dies off or at least what's above ground dies off over winter and then in the spring of its second year it grows those leaves but with a flowering shoot that comes out of the middle and can get on the large one anyway to 10 feet tall in certain places um, and it will get burrs all over it really really sticky burrs here's one from last year dog owners amongst you might recognize these especially if you've got a dog with long hair because these are almost impossible to get out of dog hair i'll just show you something they're so effective that they'll stick just to your skin and these are the burrs off of burdock after it's flowered um, these burrs are also what led to the invention of velcro <laughs> the guy that invented velcro looked at these burrs under a, a magnifying glass and i think invented velcro the next day because they're so stupendously sticky Anyway, from a forager's point of view, this is one of my favorite roots. It's a big starchy vegetable and you don't get too many of those in the foraging world. Just don't dig it up from somewhere stony because it can be hard work. All right, let's head this way. There's a, a few more interesting things here to talk about. Just keep coming round and here's something that you find in most old hedgerows. This is our gooseberry bush. And you can see we're starting in some places to get some gooseberries forming. There's a little young gooseberry. Now look at those leaves as well, because these leaves or this leaf shape reminds me so much of lots of fruiting plants like currants and when i see this leaf shape in a hedgerow i'm immediately interested there's quite a few fruiting plants that have similar leaves to that so when i see those leaves in hedgerows i'll go and have a closer look and quite often you'll get a lovely little fruity surprise now a little tip with gooseberries don't be a gooseberry fool just don't eat the skin um, people say that gooseberries are awful and bitter but if you just eat the ripe flesh and throw away the skin they are absolutely lovely so gooseberries another thing that you might have in your garden somewhere if not it's in a hedgerow near you uh, a few more things to go through let's head this way just carefully past our daffodils that have already flowered daffodils cause a lot of poisonings in Britain every year. Um, one year in particular, they caused quite a few poisonings in Bristol. I think it was in 2014. Um, but that was because a supermarket had put daffodil bulbs in the same section as their garlic and other different vegetables. And uh, uh, a large section or a few people rather from the Chinese community in Bristol um, bought those, not being able to understand the packaging, I assume, because they look very much, or daffodil bulbs look very much like garlic. And uh, another vegetable that I think they use in China called the Chinese chive. Um, so daffodils, a poisonous plant, more dangerous than you might think. We've got these pink primroses around. 
for me, the jury's out on the, the pink ones. I'll show you some yellow ones in a minute. I know the edibility of yellow primroses. They are perfectly edible and they adorn my salads again. Um, I'm not sure about all of these cultivars. Um, quite a lot of them have been imported and uh, I just don't know whether they're all edible. So what I do is I just stick to the yellow ones. If you've got a yellow primrose or a cowslip, the ones that come that grow a little bit after the primroses with a trumpet shaped flower, um, both of those are perfectly edible. Over here, in the little wild bit of my garden, we've got my favorite spring plant. Here's some wild garlic. Now these leaves uh, are what I consider to be garlic level one flavor wise. These are the mildest part of the plant and I will happily eat those raw. What I am gonna do is get a little bit of our old friend from Back to Basics One. Just down here, we've got some Arum, the Lords and Ladies. This is the Arum Italicum, which I think I mentioned with white veins and here's some Normal arum. Now this is the young leaf of arum, growing very close to my garlic, and you can see it doesn't have the tails of the more mature leaf, and looks quite a lot like wild garlic. This one, if you remember from the first video, you don't want to eat it because of those calcium oxalate crystals in the leaves, which will irritate your mouth quite badly. Um, the good thing with garlic though, is it has a key identifier, which as long as you don't suffer from uh, no sense of smell, um, all you have to do is have a smell of the leaves, wild garlic leaves, stink of garlic, as long as you're not anosmic, I think that's the word, you should be able to rule out lords and ladies. The other plant, which I will mention because it's highly poisonous, that looks a bit like this, um, which you will find in your gardens more often than in the wild, is lily of the valley. Um, lily of the valley is uh, potentially deadly, so really don't make that mistake. Again, lily of the valley will not smell anything like garlic. I did say the leaves are garlic level one. Garlic level two is these flower buds. They're about twice as hot and twice as strong. And then when the flowers, or when the buds open, you'll get about 20 or more of these white flowers. When fully open, that's kind of garlic level three. It goes up a, a stage in heat again. Then when these flowers mature, you can still you see the start of them there. There's a little triple green seed pod inside the flower, at the base of the flower. Now that'll grow and swell. And when the petals drop, that's when to go for those seed pods because the seeds inside are still soft and they are like little garlic bombs. They are really, really lovely in your cooking. Another different flavor on the plant is the flowering stem. You can see the flowering stem is sort of triangular, but the flowering stem, particularly the white bits, are sweet. So they're like, they almost taste like garlic chutney. So using different parts of the plant, uh, you can do different things in the kitchen. I really love this plant and I'm perfectly ready to go for garlic level two. Take the heat and it's uh, luckily enough something that my wife likes as well. So she won't mind kissing me later. I'll just have to feed her some. Right, around here, moving on quite quickly. Uh, we've got lots of this. This is um, a plant that flowered earlier in the year. Uh, this is winter aconite would have had a yellow flower. I can't see any still in flower. Uh, and this is a toxic plant. Grows in, well, you can see it's in quite a large patch here. And there's another part of our garden where this covers probably 20 square feet um, with yellow flowers that come out early, about the same time as your lesser celandine. Don't eat this. It's a poisonous plant. Okay, uh, moving on. Another little reminder, this is probably a better view of the Herb Robert than I gave you in the first video. Just recognize this because it grows everywhere and uh, you can rule it out as, um, as an edible as far as I'm concerned. It is edible, but it's really not very tasty. 
unlike this plant growing down here. You can see it here in a rosette with both stages of growth. So its first stage of growth would just be a rosette of these leaves. Three leaves a bit like a strawberry and then opposing leaves running down the stem. Strawberries don't have those, so that's how you can tell the difference quite easily. Then it starts to flower, and this will be the flowering stem. You can see similar leaves, and there are some opposing leaves there, but you can see at the top the way that this leaf encompasses the stem, and these leaves uh, are just a bit more elongated than the basal leaves. Now, this is a plant that's in all your vegetable patches before you turn them over. It's called uh, the wood avon or geum urbanum. Now, all parts of this plant are edible, but everything above ground to me tastes quite awful. It's sort of post-apocalyptic food, so we won't be eating this for <laughs> at least three more weeks. Um, what we do go for from this plant is the root system, and I'll just pull this up and show you. It's a very shallow root system. Shouldn't do this in public spaces. You're not supposed to uproot our native wild plants in public spaces, but in my garden here, I've got this little nested root system. And it's a shame we haven't got smell vision because I can already smell coming from these roots, uh, a very distinctive and familiar smell. It's the smell of cloves or the smell of the dentist. Um, and that's because these roots contain a, a chemical called eugenol which makes them taste just like cloves. Um, so they're a perfect clove substitute. When I'm making my mulled wine at Christmas, I get one of these plants because they're all year round. I'll clean off the roots and I'll just pop the whole plant into my wine while it's mulling. And these roots um, give off that clovey flavor. And they will do in any dish because they, they contain just exactly the same chemical as cloves. Um, really useful in the kitchen all i do is when i'm weeding places where i don't want this plant i'll collect the roots chop them off let them dry for a day or so and then put them in a jar and i have not since i was introduced to this plant i have not bought a clove and you guys hopefully if you recognize this will never need to again either um, when I say them, to remind you of the dentist, that chemical, eugenol, that's one of the primary ingredients in all dental analgesics. So um, if you didn't know, clove oil, that's a way of numbing the pain of toothache. You can use these roots for the same thing. What you would do is get a load of the roots, mash them up, put them with a bit of oil and put them on the tooth. You'll get an awful taste of cloves in your mouth, but you'll get rid of the pain temporarily. They're not a cure for ulcers or, or abscesses, but what they are is effectively a, an oral anaesthetic. They will take the pain away for a short period of time. So wood avens, whilst you're weeding them out over the next few weeks, snip off the roots and save those and you'll not need to buy a clove for a while. Moving on, there's one or two more things to go for if, uh, if you can keep going, Will, are you? able to keep holding the camera. Right, so down here, we've got a lovely plant. We uh, talked briefly about chervil in the last video, chervil being a sort of parsley-esque flavored plant, but with really poisonous lookalikes. This is a, a awful invasive weed called ground elder. Um, gardeners will recognize it and they will hate it. It gets to about two feet tall when it's flowering and it's got a sort of off-white umbellifer type flower. You can see it beginning to spread out in this nice wild patch here. Um, and it will probably spread out amongst the whole area unless I can get some other plants in to compete with it. Um, but this plant, gardeners may hate it, but foragers love it because it was brought over by the Romans as a pot herb, as a parsley flavored pot herb. And this is the reason I don't really truck with chervil because you've got something far safer, probably as common um, and tastier for a parsley flavored plant. Now, these shoots like this, I will happily put in a salad. They're quite succulent and quite sweet. These leaves, which have got more open and more sort of dark green are a bit more papery and they're not so nice in your salads 
But what they are good for is blanching and using as a spinach substitute. So what you would do is collect as much as you want, get these leaves and just treat them like spinach. You want to get rid of the stems as much as you can because they do stay a little bit tough. But ground elder, whilst you're weeding it over and over again this year, pick a bit and use it, like I say, either as a salad leaf or as a spinach type substitute or just as a parsley flavoured herb to chuck into anything that you want a bit of parsley-ish flavouring in. Now we're going to head this way, actually round this way Will. Um, we'll leave the ground ivy, that's everywhere, so we'll do that in another video. And uh, we'll head over to our cherry tree for the grand finale. just walking over a bed of violets here. Violets are edible. I don't particularly like them, um, but you can certainly do lovely things with the flowers. Uh, what I've brought you around here for is this lovely mushroom growing out of my cherry tree. Um, I was absolutely delighted to find this here a couple of days ago. This is young chicken of the woods and being as it's the 16th of April, I'm surprised to find it this early. Um, it's a mushroom that I associate more with uh, the early months of summer. Now at this stage, it's nice and floppy and uh, reasonably moist and it's kind of at its best edible stage. I'm going to let this grow for another day or two and take a few shelves off of it then though, just so I can get a bit more and hopefully um, because we've got some rain over the next few days, it won't dry out. Um, when it dries out, it's just nowhere near as good an edible. It's actually not a particularly pleasant edible when it's all dried out. But when it's young and fresh and bulbous, as you see here, chicken of the woods is about the best chicken substitute that any vegetarian, and I did become vegetarian last year, could ever wish for. Uh, its uh, scientific name is Lytiporus sulfurius. Sulfurius, obviously referring to the colour. Um, there is one thing to know about chicken of the woods though, before you all start munching what you find. Uh, that's, well, there's a couple of things. First of all, it must be cooked, just like most wild mushrooms. And from a, a novice's point of view, I'd say just cook any wild mushroom. There's not really any that you should eat raw, uh, unless you really know what you're doing. This one must be cooked. But then even after it's cooked, some people have an allergy to it. Now, that allergy will make you quite gastric and apparently it will make your lips swell up a bit like you've had a Botox injection or something like that. Now, some people might like that kind of thing, but I'm sure it's not something you want as a byproduct from dinner. Um, so when you eat chicken of the woods for the first time, I suggest you only have a small portion, um, maybe about half of what I've got there in my between my fingers and then wait 24 or even 48 hours just to be absolutely sure that you're not allergic to it now if you have any tingles in your tummy during that time or if your lips start to feel a bit weird then don't eat any more leave the rest for me or put it in the post and i'll i'll look after that for you um, right, that's the chicken of the woods. I'm going to try and finish all of these back to basics videos on a mushroom. I will fail and falter uh, when it gets to video five or six, I'm sure, but I've got a couple more lined up for the next few days. Um, if you want to find out more about any of the plants that I've just run through quickly or the chicken of the woods, then go to our website www.wildfooduk and you'll find we've got mushroom guides um, and hedgerow guides and some recipes in there as well with more detailed videos quite often of the things that I've spoken about today. Um, we've also got a book which uh, I could show you. In fact, let's just do one last little introduction. It won't be to a plant this time. Uh, yeah. Oh, well done. <laughs> My beautiful assistant. 
Rachel, my lovely wife, has brought over our book, which we're really, really proud of. It's got everything that I spoke about today, mushroom-wise and plants, and the photography took us about seven years to get together. So we're really, really proud of this book. If you want to get it, it's on our website and it's on Amazon. But what I'm even more proud of is over here. I did say that I had a newborn at home in the last video. They do also say never work with uh, animals or, or children when you're doing any filming. Um, but this is baby Bonnie and this is my lovely wife, Rachel. And uh, we're just going to say goodbye now. I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, any comments, please feel free to leave them. And I'll do another Back to Basics video, episode three, as soon as I can. In the meantime, like I said in the first video, stay safe and stay positive and try and stay away from each other as well.